So behind me are two Mini Coopers, an old one and a new one. And in this video, we're gonna find out which one is better for about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Which one should you buy? This is my 1993 Rover Mini Cooper. It's one of the original Minis. They sold them from 1959 all the way up through 2000. And this is a newer Mini, of course. This is a 2013 Mini Cooper S JCW GP. Let's go take them for a drive. but it's built to hold a family of four. It was built to be cheap, affordable, simple to run, and that's pretty much it. But it turned out to be an absolute icon because the man who designed this car, Sir Alec Izagonis, was kind of a genius. You see, in order to design this car with a lot of interior space, he had to push the wheels all the way to the corners. That gave this small car a very wide footprint. The engine is a transverse mount design something very common today, <laughs> but very unusual for the 1950s. And the transmission actually lives underneath the engine, which is also pretty unusual, especially for the 1950s. Now the interior volume, obviously, pretty small, but I'm 6'1", and I fit really well. And let's talk about that little engine that's making all sorts of noise right now. This is called the A-Series engine. This one is a 1.275 liters. Uh, it's a four-cylinder, of course, and by 1993, these engines were actually fuel-injected, believe it or not, which is great up here at elevation at some seven, 8,000 feet above sea level. Now, power, probably 74 horsepower. It's not a very high-powered engine, but it doesn't really need to be because the car weighs like 1,400 pounds, and I have to say, this 1275 is one of the best engines I have ever driven. It's just such a fun little lump. It is so willing to rev. Pretty much at any point within its RPM range, you give it the beans, it does its best to provide as much torque as it possibly can, and it zips all the way up to 6,000 RPM. But of course, the real news with the Mini has to be the handling, because right now I'm driving behind that little GP Mini, doing the best I can to keep up, and granted, he is getting away from me a little bit, but this little car handles better than pretty much any car I've ever driven. Specifically, the steering is just, I mean, it's just incredible. It's so precise, so incredibly direct. It is better than a 911, and I've driven a new 911. Amazing car, but this, this has better steering. Now, the transmission is a four-speed unit. It's not amazing, to be honest with you, but it does the job. Unfortunately, this thing is kind of revved out at 60 miles an hour. You're probably spinning 3,200 RPM doing 60 miles an hour, which is uh, a rather unpleasant thing for longer highway drives. But get it out here on a mountain road on a nice sunny day, and there's pretty much nothing better. Well, welcome to the 2013 Mini. Now, this is called an R56 Mini, and it isn't quite the newest generation. This is actually one generation old now, but my goodness, is this a really, really fun car. So, let's talk about it. This is called the GP. It's the ultimate high-performance version, and oh my God, coming out of that old one, this one is so incredibly quick. The performance envelope on these newer Minis is so berserkly high. They are like Mini BMWs and they just pull. So this is a 1.6 liter turbo, over 200 horsepower. The car is still quite lightweight and when you plant it, I mean, it just takes off into the horizon. Now certainly it's a different experience than that older Mini. That older Mini, you can have fun at 25 miles an hour. This new one, you're gonna wanna push a little bit because the performance envelope, like I said, is just so high. But get it on a nice twisty road like this, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a more fun car. Now the steering wheel comes out at you like a normal car. It doesn't go straight up like on the old Mini. A little bit more numb, especially on center. It does have power steering, I know. I know the luxuries, right? 
but uh, overall incredible steering, very communicative. The transmission, much more precise, much more direct, and of course, six speeds. So this thing is comfortable doing 75, 80 miles an hour on the highway all day long. So when you really push it, it does almost feel like it wants to understeer more than the old one. And that could be because of the weight compared to the little guy, but still such a direct vehicle. One of my favorites to drive. You do sit, I would say lower in the car. The windows are taller, so visibility isn't as good as the old one. But then of course you have real crash protection, real rollover protection, airbags in here. So, I mean, it's great having the visibility in the old one, but that doesn't help you much if you're in the hospital, of course. Now, the engine in this car isn't quite as bubbly. That old one, I mean, it, it snarls, it growls, it pops. It's not perfect. Sometimes it goes bang, pop, 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 pop. You know, it's like it's a little all over the place sometimes, especially when it gets hot on like warm summer days, but it's got so much character. These newer four cylinders, especially with turbocharging and direct injection, they're so much more precise, more fuel efficient even, but they've lost some of the soul. Uh, they don't they don't make the snarls and the pops and the bangs at higher RPM that the old ones would do naturally. That one, even at idle, like blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's got like this cammy sound to it. The new one, it's a uh, much more refined experience, but not quite as fun to listen to. So now that we've driven them back to back, let's do a comparison and see exactly what Mini has kept from the original design and what they have changed. Probably the most iconic design statement when looking at the original Mini is the perfectly round headlight with the chrome trim ring around it, the turn signal located below that, and the trapezoidal grill. That screams Mini Cooper. With this newer Mini, BMW has kept the formula pretty much the same. So we've got a round headlight with the chrome trim ring. The turn signal is mounted below the headlight, although it's now integrated in the main headlight unit. And then the trapezoidal grill is more or less similar as well, but below that things get a little bit different. So you'll notice fog lights on this model and the newer engines require a lot more cooling. So we've got additional grills below that. Now the original Mini had several variations of the iconic logo. This is the 1993 example. So you can say Mini Cooper with the wreath in the middle of the design and then the wings surrounding the outside. It's also worth noting that back in the day, the Cooper was kind of the high-end performance model. A lot of Minis existed that aren't Coopers. On this newer model, Mini has really condensed the badge, although they've even changed it since then. So now it just says Mini in the middle with the wings on the outside. Here in the US, every Mini is a Cooper, but if you go abroad to like Europe, not every Mini is a Cooper. Same thing like the old one. Now to get into the classic Mini, you grab onto this metal chrome thin door handle. You push in on the button and then of course you can open the door and it makes such a satisfying clunk when you go to close it. Now on this new model, the same basic design exists, the thin chrome door handle. Unfortunately, the newer Minis have gone to like this plastic chrome which starts to peel and warp over time and the button is gone too. So now there's an electronic switch at the back. You pull that and the door opens, the closing thunk. Ooh, not nearly as satisfying. The gas cap is one of the more iconic elements of the classic Mini. Now these were actually made out of metal. You push on the handle and then it springs open and then you put your key in there to put gas in it. But it makes the best little clunk when you go to close it. So the new Mini has retained that throwback chrome gas cap. It's implemented a little differently. The, the gas tank is no longer in the trunk, but you can see it flings open like that. However, it's now of course a plastic, not the metal, although it does have an automatic locking function, which is a nice touch over the original. The classic Mini does not have a hatchback, and this is surprising to some, but believe it or not, it has a trunk with a tailgate. Now for its size, a pretty decent boot. However, it is a little odd they didn't go with the tailgate design, probably to save costs. I did see some interesting pictures from like the 1970s that showed the team at British Leyland attempting to develop a trunk for the Mini, but it was deemed unnecessary. And then of course, Volkswagen went ahead and did it in the 70s anyways with the Golf, and that was a huge success. So they, they probably should have gone that route eventually. Now, when you look at the new Mini, things have changed quite a bit. Obviously, they finally came to their wisdom and developed a hatchback and quite a big one at that. Now this model is a GP, which means it doesn't have the rear seats. Instead, you get this brace across the rear end. Uh, however, if you did have the rear seats, they fold down pretty easily and it is a much larger, more usable trunk. 
So the Mini has a pretty standard, rather flimsy hood. There's a little safety catch and then it lifts open. Now, as we mentioned, of course, a transverse layout front wheel drive. This one has fuel injection, but look how packed in there that engine bay is. This vehicle uses every inch of available space. So one of the smarter elements of the new Mini is the clamshell hood. The whole thing opens as one giant unit, which gives you much better access to the engine bay than in the old one. But once again, still a small car with a lot of stuff packed into a relatively tiny space. Now this old Mini is rolling on a set of 12 inch wheels. In fact, some of these even had 10 inch wheels and the brakes are about the size of, I don't know, a Petri dish. There are actually discs in the front, but drums in the rear. Now this newer Mini is rolling on a set of 17 inch wheels. This was a special design for the GP. And these cars had insanely large brakes, like six piston brakes in the front, big brakes in the rear too, and they stop on a dime. Stepping inside the classic Mini, the first thing you notice is just how thin the doors are, and this was on purpose to maximize interior volume. In fact, the really early cars didn't even have roll-up windows. But some interesting things, these are actually the original window winder and door handle. You can see they say Mini Cooper on them right there. Get a shot of that. Um, but they wind in the opposite direction as you'd expect. And the door handle, very high quality. You got this aluminum um, fixture, pull it back, and that's how you get in and out. So the iconic mini design is the speedometer right in the center, that big pie-dish looking speedometer. Unfortunately, the later minis quickly lost that design feature and now we have a pretty boring dashboard by the time we got to 1993, but there are some similarities between the new one. For example, take a look at these vents, round vents. They move around, you can point them in every direction and you twist them to close them. The new car has pretty much the same thing. The new Mini does have a throwback to the 1960s models with that giant center mounted speedometer. A really cool feature. I love that these cars included that. And then you'll notice same design in terms of vents four round vents across the dash. You spin them to lock and open them. Pretty cool stuff. The glove box situation in the Classic Mini is pretty interesting. You've got this really flimsy plastic panel, pull down the latch, and that's your glove box. Oh, and by the way, that's your sorry excuse for cup holders, these two little dimples in the glove box lid. That's it. Uh, luckily, there is actually kind of a hole in the back of the glove box, so you could, in theory, warm or cool things in there, which is, you know, pretty sophisticated. Now, what about the lower glove box, you're asking? There's clearly a glove box down here. This is totally fake genuinely fake. This is a handle to nothing. It doesn't open whatsoever. These Japanese spec cars, this car was actually sold new in Japan, had air conditioning. And if you got air conditioning, they needed to cover some of the air conditioning internals. So they molded a piece of plastic that looks exactly like a glove box, but actually doesn't function as anything. This car actually does have two glove boxes. Push this big chrome button and that opens the bottom glove box, and this is great for storing large items. But did you know that these R56 generations of Mini actually have a second hidden glove box right up here? Push in on this panel, and you've got a second glove box. But this car, well, this car is kind of a mess, to be honest. This is probably the worst GP in the country, and one of the things that doesn't work is a second glove box. But I did have an older version of this car that had it, and I'll insert that clip here. There's a secret glove box, which, Mini owners get upset when I talk about it because you're not supposed to know about it, but here, check it out. Whoa, the actual interior trim folds back and displays another secret little cubby. Now, as I briefly mentioned, this car is right-hand drive because it was sold in Japan. Uh, and then, of course, it made its way to Seattle and then Colorado. So it's kind of a world traveler built in the UK, of course. Uh, but right-hand drive, I don't think this is the original steering wheel, but it is very cool. It's a nardy wheel. Three big gauges in front of you for speed. You've got temperature and fuel with some dummy lights in the middle. And then on the right is your tachometer in British Racing Green. Definitely love that a lot. Uh, and then a couple of other interesting things. Your turn signals are in the normal place, um, even on a left-hand drive car to the left of the steering wheel, uh, and you actually push in for the horn. That's kind of a funky thing. And then to the right of the steering wheel is your wiper controls with your windshield wiper squirter. So making your way into the new car, obviously left-hand drive. Something interesting about the GP, because this was the track-focused model, they only brought 500 to the States, they don't actually have steering wheel buttons. They wanted this to be the ultra pure driving experience. So no volume tune, no even cruise control in this car. It's very stripped down and it's a very chunky wheel. I've got my tachometer right in front of me, which looks pretty good. Uh, some other interesting things from this perspective, the dash, got the super nice stitched leather dash, which unfortunately has spent a lot of time and I believe this car came from 
Texas, or the Texas Sun. Um, this is a $5,000 job to replace, by the way. It's a very expensive part because it was really limited. And then one other thing, I want to show you the key because the key is one of the coolest parts of this car. It looks like a little flying saucer. And then that goes into a little docking port over here to the right of the steering wheel. So you can buy both of these cars for about fifteen dollars to $20,000. Which one should you purchase? Well, the new car is a much more usable automobile for day-to-day -day use for hauling friends and family much better. However, the old one is in a lot of ways more fun. I know it's a lot, a lot slower than the new one. It's not nearly as stable at high speeds, but the zippy nature, the size, the incredible lightness of this make it drive like pretty much no other car on the road except for maybe I don't know, a Polaris Razor <laughs> with a turbocharged engine, right? Something just totally uh, left hand that's really lightweight. For me, I think that this is a more fun vehicle, but not necessarily better than the new one. The new Minis are still an incredible hoot to drive. They are just super nimble. The front wheel drive aspect, the, uh, the quick steering, the dialed in suspension make these incredibly fun too, just not quite as visceral as the old one. So for me, the old one is still the way I'd go, but if it's an everyday driver, of course, awful choice go ahead and get yourself a new one well let me know which one you'd rather have for about fifteen thousand dollars and as always this has been tommy with the fast lane car check out tflcar.com for the latest and greatest in new car reviews